Number 10, starting off strong with Pope Urban VI. Ever heard of the papal schism? No? Well, allow me to tell you about a moment in history that will make you just shake your head. Pope Urban VI was directly involved in a major schism in 1378 that resulted in two separate feuding papacies. Urban VI wasn't a nice guy by any means of the imagination. He was prone to violent outbursts, and when he caught wind of a conspiracy to get rid of him, he had six cardinals arrested, tormented, and executed. He allegedly even complained that the tormentors weren't doing a good enough job because they weren't screaming hard enough. Yeah. Hard guy. People were afraid of him, and he was Italian, meaning the French side of the papacy were afraid they'd be alienated as they were. So 13 French cardinals fled Rome and claimed that Urban was only voted in due to fear. They chose their own pope in 1378, who became anti pope Clement VII. For four decades, this competition between the two popes launched the Western schism, a thorn in the Catholic Church's side. Number nine, Innocent VIII. Innocent? I think not. I mean, duh, otherwise he wouldn't be on this list. During the reign of his predecessor, Pope Sixtus IV, gangs rioted in the streets, conclaves were scheming, so the election of a new pope had heavy political motives. So they elected Innocent. One of his first orders was a call for a crusade against the Turks, but it required throwing Italy into anarchy first. He had a past conflict with the King of Naples, so he excommunicated him and invited King Charles VIII of France to rule Naples instead. This created issues that would survive even his reign. But not only that, Innocent was responsible for a deadly witch hunt across Europe. He issued a papal bill to persecute anyone suspected of practicing witchcraft and worked alongside a German inquisitor to get the job done. This bill was heavily abused for political gain, and along with his relationship with bribery, he ruined the church's reputation. But honestly, it wasn't that pristine to begin with, so let's keep going to prove that point. Number 8, Stephen VI. It's always the quiet ones who become grave robbers. No one really saw this coming. But before we get to that, some background. Stephen was the son of a priest. I know, I know, already. Starting up strong, and slowly rose up in the papacy. It was actually his later sworn enemy, Formosus, who promoted him to bishop in the first place. But by 896, Formosus was raising an army against his patron, establishing them as enemies. Formosus died suspiciously, but that still didn't mean that their debt was settled. Stephen became pope in May 896 and held the papacy for only one year, but that didn't stop him from making history. In January 897, Stephen exhumed the body of his predecessor, Pope Formosus, propped his body up on a throne and put him on trial, a dead guy on trial. This momentous occasion became known as Cadaver Synod. He launched accusation after accusation against the silent corpse and even appointed a deacon to speak for him. Surprise, surprise, the corpse was found guilty of coveting the papacy and violating church canons. Stephen just couldn't let sleeping popes lie. Number 7, Benedict the Ninth. Benedict served as Pope not once, but three times between 1032 and 1048, and is the only man ever to do so. He was placed into the papacy at the absurdly young age, some say as young as 11, some say 20, either way, he was unprepared for the power. He received the position after his father paid off a group of Romans. He held the position for four years before he was eventually pushed out due to threat of assassination, but he would be back with a vengeance. He was mostly abhorred for his licentious behavior, with an 11th century Pope having this to say about him, as being so vile, so foul, so exorable that I shudder to think of it. His contemporaries accused him of several crimes including fornication, bestiality, theft, bribery, violation, etc. He was exiled in 1044 and then he returned to Rome to somehow excommunicate his replacement and took back the papacy. Rome hated him so much that eventually Benedict sold the chair to his godfather who would be named Pope Gregory VI. He retired from his religious life and even got married to his cousin. The events of his life were so quiet after that no one really knows what his exact date of death was. Number six, Sixtus the Fourth. But let's talk about Innocent's predecessor, shall we? Pope Sixtus the Fourth. Remember how the whole chastity thing apparently went out the window, right? Well, Pope Sixtus the Fourth was no exception. Plus, some added incest. Sixtus had six illegitimate children, one of which he had with his very own sister. Though it was perfectly acceptable for him to have grotesque appetites, he put severe restrictions on the desires of his subordinates. He created a church tax on workers of the night and charged priests if they wanted to have mistresses. This boost in funding helped fund the construction of the Sistine Chapel. Sixtus also became a kind of pimp at one point, even running his own brothel of sorts. He also had a huge penchant for nepotism, as did most corrupt popes, as we'll see later, making six of his nephews cardinals. One of his nephews, Pietro, he indulged so much that he left the papacy 
keep a seat in so much debt that Sixus had to raise taxes again. Number five, Pope Leo X. Ah, the Medici's, another famous and scandalous family that we just might have to do a list on. But let's talk about the first Medici Pope, Giovanni de Medici, later known as Pope Leo X. When he first began, he brought a refreshing new outlook to the papacy, one that celebrated the arts. However, Leo was famous for his lavish lifestyle, spending both his own and the money of the church on indulgent habits. Speaking of indulgence, the reality of the papal finances dripping away hit hard, so he came up with a clever way of restoring them by creating something called indulgences. Indulgences were a way for people to save themselves from damnation despite their sins. No matter what someone did, they could wash their sin away simply by buying an indulgence to wipe their slate clean so they can enter the pearly gates. Literally so corrupt. Pay your way to heaven. This process infuriated the famous Martin Luther because he completely disagreed with it, and I'm not talking clearly about Martin Luther King Jr., I'm not talking about him, but he would later lead the Protestant Reformation. Number four, Boniface the Eighth. Who didn't this guy piss off? That's the real question. During his time as Pope between 1294 and 1303, Boniface clashed with the King of Germany, the King of France, and even a poet named Dante Alighieri. I feel like every Pope on this list was rumored to have relations with men or women of varying ages, and Boniface is no exception. Just putting that out there, so once again, vow of chastity out the window. He interfered with wars all across Europe from Sicily to Scotland and he wasn't merciful. One of the most unchristian things he did was betray a town he promised to keep safe. During one of his many diplomatic battles, he was up against a town called Palestrina. He promised the town and its people that if they surrendered, they would not be hurt. They believed him because he's the Pope, so why would he lie? Well, as soon as the gates opened, he ordered that it be sacked and salted, so completely went back on his word there. Number three in the number three spot is Sergius III. Also had a child out of wedlock and somehow made that king become pope. I don't understand, like what the heck is going on here? Everything was so corrupt and insane, it's overwhelming. I've said it several times already, vow of chastity. Get out of here. Sergius was a good buddy to Pope Stephen VI and even supported him during the cadaver fiasco, which eventually paid off. He was elected Pope by Stephen's party in 898 and is believed to be the only Pope to order another Pope's death. In 904, the anti-pope Christopher was strangled to death, an act that was ordered by Sergius III. He took control of the papacy that very same year. So strike one, took a life. Strike two, began relations with Marozia, the daughter of Theophylactus, the very man who helped expand Sergius's territory. He also, as previously mentioned, fathered a son with her who went on to be Pope John XI. Number two, Pope Alexander VI. We talked about the Medicis and it's only natural therefore to bring up the Borgia. Specifically, Pope Alexander VI. Pope Alexander, aka Rodrigo Borgia, along with his children, left a trail of scandal wherever they went, mingled within their stories everything you need for a dramatic TV show starring Jeremy Irons. Lust, murder, betrayal, political intrigue and nepotism, fratricide, incest, the list goes on. He bribed his way to the top, establishing careful and strategic political alliances as he climbed his way into the papal seat. He was the only pope to openly acknowledge and spoil his children, even making his son Cesare head of the military. He used his daughter Lucrezia as a political pawn to establish marital alliances. When a more promising relationship appeared, he quickly dissolved them to establish a new union. He himself had multiple mistresses, each of whom he really didn't try to hide. Venosa de Catane and Giulia Farnese were both married noblewomen and became his two most famous lovers. If you want to learn more about the scandalous man and family, be sure to check out our list of top 10 uncomfortable scandals that surround the Borgias. It should be on our Page, so go check it out. Number one, John the Twelfth. One of, if not the worst, Pope in history is John the Twelfth. People absolutely hated this guy. What didn't he do? What didn't he do? He ruled for nine years in the 900s, right at the end of what historians call the dark century or the papal pornography. Yes, that word means what you think it means. Rule of the workers of the night, so very sexy time. The papacy was now in the hands of rival Italian families. John was elected pope at just 18 years old and was haunted by layers of family corruption and drama. Fresh out of puberty, papal duties were the last thing on his mind. He was far more interested in drinking, gambling, and well, 
occupying himself with the opposite sex. From an outside view, his behavior encouraged Rome to slide into decay. He turned the Lateran Palace into a brothel where John would openly carry out affairs with married women. Distracted by indulgence, his enemies closed in, and with the papal army bankrupt because of him, he was forced to bend the knee for protection to the King of the Germans. He received a very stern scolding from a man decades his senior, but despite that, even then, John continued his reign of debauchery and childishness. He took lives and tortured many who opposed him until the day he finally met his end. Some say his heart gave out from a particularly athletic session with a woman, while others say he died by the hands of the mistress's lover. Either way, he died covered in sweet, sweet sin. Kicking off the list at number 10, Madame de Pompadour. One of the most powerful women in the 18th century, France, Madame de Pompadour is known mainly as the mistress of King Louis XV of France. The last ever portrait of her shows us a respectable middle-aged woman piercing through your skull. Or your soul. I don't know why I said skull, it's pretty intense, but we'll keep it right through your skull, apparently. Since her birth in 1721, she was well educated and quickly she became a member of the French court. She is remembered mainly as the official chief mistress of King Louis XV from 1745 to 1751. But in 1756, she was officially named the 13th lady in waiting. That's a pretty big deal. Over her lifetime, she became the political advisor to the king, which many historians aren't too fond of. But to be fair, she put in the work to get his attention. She would show up to his place in a carriage at night. She would put on plays, like actual productions where she was the lead. I don't know why I did Peter Pan, but hey, that's how I do it. She would perform plays about nymphs and the gods, so if that doesn't deserve a super like, I'm not really sure what does. Number 9, Veronica Franco. Born of a merchant man and his wife, a courtesan, Veronica was destined for a movie worthy life. Franco lived in the 1500s and her father ensured that she was equipped with a strong education. She quickly found a love for reading and writing, her poetry becoming part of her legacy later on. Sadly though, her beloved father died very suddenly, leaving her family close to ruin, and so her mother stepped in to give her a different sort of education. She was an excellent student. And though she married a much older doctor when she was just 16 years old, she was later unfaithful with the merchant dissolving the marriage entirely. She then became known as an honest courtesan, meaning she was highly educated and could fraternize with important and dignified personnel of the time. She had a short affair with King Henry III of France. She also continued her writing pursuits and was even accepted in one of the most well known literary circles in Venice, and two of her volumes were published. This is in the 1500s, keep in mind, that's, that's incredibly rare. As a sexually free and intellectual woman, she would have made quite the stir. Sadly, she died penniless at 45 after she lost all of her wealth in the plague. But she is forever immortalized for her poetry and her philanthropy in helping old and destitute courtesans. Prior to the plague, she planned to build a safe house for them. Number eight, Mata Hari. Birth name Margaretha Zell, this scandalous figure in history, was an exotic dancer with a tragic past turned. Super spy. At age 27, Madame moved to Paris and reinvented herself as an artiste. As most do at that age and that time of their life, she tapped into her Dutch roots and started to perform these dance acts under the alias Lady Gresha McLeod. She was the first dancer, check this out, the first dancer to go fully nude. Her shows, of course, got busy. People were into this new found idea. She was the talk of the town, many towns for that matter. And eventually she got so good she started to tour. Yeah, like Green Day, she would tour all around. For years she would travel around Europe and perform these sold out crowds, but the most intriguing part was her clientele. These military officers and aristocrats would give her gifts after these shows. They wanted to hang out, of course. They were in love after a performance like that. Mata was on board, she loved this. Especially coming from a tragic, horrible marriage previously, this was the life that she needed. So around 1914, her dancing days were starting to decline, those patellas were starting to catch up to her, plus the war also broke out and things changed. Hari ended up being sent back to Holland and was later approached by Karl Kromer, German counsel in Amsterdam, because the men she was in contact with were considered a valuable asset at this time. So she went from being a dancer to a spy, codename H21. That's so sick. James Bond who? Number seven, Empress Theodora. Theodora from the brothel, as she's often known as. I don't know why, but here we are. From actress to marrying Emperor Justinian I, Empress Theodora had quite the life. The two ruled together during the golden period of the Byzantine Empire. She was the most powerful woman ever seen in Byzantium. Just like her mother, Theodora was born into the theater and would travel performing acrobatics, dancing and stripping, while also working as a lady of the night, because the kind of the two went hand in hand. 
She was said to have danced a particularly lurid routine with geese. Don't let your imagination run too far with that one. So how did she marry an emperor? Well, there was a tradition in the Byzantine court for emperors to marry beauty contest winners. Entrants could be from any class. But Justinian still had to amend that law that stated he couldn't marry an actress to make it happen. But she was the most beautiful, so you know, do it up. 20 years his junior, Justinian ensured she was crowned as his equal. As they were matched in intelligence, ambition, and energy, the two heralded in a new era for the Byzantine Empire. Number six, Cleopatra. Cleopatra had some wild methods herself to get attention, you know, believing she was the goddess Isis. She tried to appear as the goddess as often as she could. So she would do so by preparing these dazzling entrances everywhere she went. She would also look fabulous. She's known as like the most beautiful queen ever for this reason. The most famous entrance she made was in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria. This was an important time in ancient Egypt. There were problems with the family. She was banished at this time, but she still wanted to meet the Roman general Caesar. Hmm, how do you meet the man nicknamed the bald adulterer without being seen? Well, she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack like a bowling ball and then personally hand delivered right to Caesar's bedroom. DoorDash. The king. See ya. I'm gonna sneak into concerts by using this method, see if it actually works. So she won the heart of Rome's future dictator. Great. And then eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Quite the play, if you ask me. Now, her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance. And in a following battle, he drowned in the Nile, leading to Cleopatra's ultimate return to the throne. All you gotta do is take your clothes off and jump in a sack. See ya. Number five, Nell Gwynn. Good old, pretty, witty Nell Gwynn. Perhaps one of, if not the most, famous actress to ever take up the stages of old. Women were not allowed to perform in theaters until King Charles II took up the throne after Cromwell banned theater altogether, because he was the worst. To bring back some space to the world, not only did he bring back theater, he brought women to the stage, because seeing them dressed up as men was kind of hot because they had wore tights. Anyways, enter Nell Gwynn, who would later become his mistress. She started out as an orange seller in his theaters, very often synonymous with being a lady of the night, but her natural wit and charm caught the eye of an actor named Charles Hart. She soon became his lover, but she soon joined the troupe as a comedic actress. She had a series of lovers before King Charles became enamored with her among his other love affairs. The guy was busy. She wasn't greedy, but Charles couldn't help but spoil her. She never received a title, but after calling their son a right in front of them and she was like what else am I supposed to call him? Their son became the Duke of St. Albans. The public adored her and was the only royal mistress in history to provoke public adoration. Once while she was in a coach, the public thought she was the Duchess of Portsmouth. Instead, she stuck her head out the window and said, pray good people be civil. I'm the Protestant Good for you, Nell. She died sadly just past her 30s, likely due to the lead makeup she wore. She survived the king by just two years and when he died, he said, please take care of Nell Gwynn because she's the cutest. Number four, Marilyn Monroe. We've all heard her name, but do we even know why? Who was Marilyn Monroe? Real name, Norma Jean. She was an actor in LA who over time became a sex symbol. She was in numerous blockbusters around the 50s and to this day, she's still an icon. Her fame, of course, meant unwanted attention at times, most times. Like so many celebrities now, her private life was the center of attention, and it was quite a lot to deal with alone, I'm sure, let alone the entire world watching you and judging you. The rumors going around about her and John F. Kennedy and how she was having an affair, and then she divorced her third husband right after that happened, and then just at age 36, she was found next to a bottle of Namboodle pills, which were sleeping pills. Following a celebrity's life can be pretty harmful, especially when you hold them up to this standard because they're famous, or they're good looking, it's toxic. If Marilyn Monroe was alive today and this all happened now, it would probably be even worse because now we have bored people on TikTok. So she'd probably have a worse time. Number three, the Marquis de Sade. Ooh, we're getting spicy. This man was so wild that people are startled to learn that he was actually real. He is the founder of the term sadism, which should say a lot about him. And he was known for his scandalous and erotic texts that the public hungered for. Donatien Alphonse Francois Marquis de Sade lived from 1740 to 1814 and died in a mental asylum. His works were banned in France all the way up till 1957. Even his very name was scrubbed from the family legacy. Descendants, along with a very interesting historian found his work bricked up behind a wall in the attic of Condé Castle. The erotica he wrote is even too extreme by today's standards. He literally held nothing back. 
To people who admire him, his novels are about exploring the dark hidden impulses of human nature. Saad fought hard against the civilized restraints on behavior imposed on the state, while others interpret his work as a justification for all the awful crimes he committed. 120 Days in Sodom is his most famous work, which he wrote while in prison in the Bastille before being let out during the revolution. Many look back upon him today as a philosopher who challenged control and ideas, all while still making any new reader blush. Number 2. Anne Boleyn this was considered one of the biggest scandals ever, this entire marriage. King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married, Anne was his second wife, and she was crowned queen in 1533, but only three years later, in 1536, she was charged with adultery, conspiracy against the king, and incest. Even worse, she was found guilty, and come May 19th, 1536, she had her head taken off at Tower Green. Cut to today, was Anne Boleyn falsely accused? What do we know? Well, many believe that King Henry issued these charges in order to get Anne just out of the picture. She didn't produce a male hair, and right after she was executed, King Henry married his third wife, Jane Seymour, with the main goal in mind to have a son. Now, originally, Anne was a member of Henry's court. She was a maid of honor to Catherine, his first wife, and in typical kingly fashion, he tried to sleep around with her, but she wasn't into him initially. Now, when they did get married, it was quite the task. Divorce was a no go under the Catholic Church, so Henry argued that Anne had previously married his brother Arthur. He argued that the Pope wrongfully granted that marriage, so he found a Pope. Hope loophole. Wow. And of course at number one we have Giacomo Casanova. This man left behind his colorful life story wrapped within the pages of an erotic memoir. It was so scandalous that even the censored version was put on the Vatican's list of prohibited books. But in 2011 his scandalous pages were put on display making the public blush. But it wasn't just his tales of sex and love that would shock you, but the sheer craziness of the life he lived. He lived from 1725 to 1798 and was the son of an actress. In film adaptations with David Tennant and Heath Ledger, he is depicted as an all out playboy with unwavering charm. But he was also a true enlightened polymath. Voltaire, Catherine the Great, Benjamin Franklin, and Mozart all hung out with this dude. He was a gambler, an astrologer, a spy, a traveler, wrote a proto feminist pamphlet, and a science fiction novel. He basically invented the lottery, saved a man who was being accidentally killed by his doctors, he fluctuated from penniless to extremely rich to penniless at the end of his life, and wrote his memoir while working as a librarian, of all things. In and amongst his adventures were over 120 notorious love affairs with countesses, milkmaids, and even nuns. Sword fights, escapes, cons, arrests, the life of Casanova made for a very interesting read. Number 10, Julie Daubigny, a sword wielding opera singer? Uh, yes, sign me up, please. I am so here for this. There is so much to unpack about this story. So, she was born the daughter of the secretary of King Louis XIV's master of horse. She moved to the court of Versailles in 1682. Her father was an ex expert swordsman and educated her alongside the boys he taught because she was his only kid. She even dressed as a boy and excelled at the sport. She ran off with a fencing master and toured, showing off her skills to wide audiences. One audience member, however, couldn't believe she was a woman because she was so good, so she flashed the crowd, who responded with complete stunned silence. She began singing at the Marseille Opera where she met her first love, a young woman. This woman, though, was packed off to a convent by her family, and Julie followed to help her escape. They burned down the convent and ran off together and she was actually sentenced to death by the parliament, but Julie would continue to live on one adventure after the next. She would later be pardoned by parliament and continue to go on to become an opera star and had many other lovers. Number 9, Betty Page. If you're a fan of pinup art, then you almost have to be a fan of the one, the only, Betty Page. She is the one who defined the art form. Page was an American pinup icon who scandalized society with her risque and alternative kink modeling photos. We can thank her for the bikini, as it was Page herself who made it popular. Pop stars to this very day model themselves after her, her iconic haircut being found on stars such as Katy Perry and Dita Von Teese, her poses in her Famous photos were found in music videos such as like, it's just, it's, she had a massive amount of influence. She redefined a sexually repressed era with her free spirit and unabashed presentation of her sexuality. But she was taken advantage of a lot of the time. Betty actually didn't make any royalties after her prince until Hugh Hefner got her an agent. But by the end of the 1950s, Betty walked away after a nervous breakdown and retired as 
a born again Christian. There was a lot of suffering that Betty didn't show to the world or even admit to herself. Sadly, the woman whose face everyone knew was diagnosed with schizophrenia due to severe trauma from her childhood. For years, no one knew if she had even passed away, but people were still obsessed with her until she was finally tracked down for a documentary. She refused to take any photos but would give interviews over the phone. She finally hired a lawyer to try and recoup some of the money she lost for her image and spent her final days living with her brother in LA. Number 8, Cleopatra. Uh, duh. Uh Cleopatra, the woman who had the world talking all the time. She made sure that whenever she entered the room, all eyes and ears were turned in her direction, jaws on the floor. She is one of, if not the most famous Egyptian queen to ever have lived. Believing she was the goddess Isis herself, she prepared dazzling entrances wherever she went. But it wasn't just her looks, in fact, some accounts say she wasn't actually particularly outstanding in that department, it was just the whole package and how she presented herself. It was indeed her wit, charm, intense intelligence that had men and nations kneeling to her. Her brother slash husband wasn't a huge fan, as it was clear she was always trying to get past him to hold the whole title. But one way she overstepped her husband was when she had herself delivered to the Roman Emperor Caesar wrapped in a carpet naked. She easily won the senior emperor and gained him as her lover and eventually she even won the Egyptian throne, soon to become the famous Queen of the Nile. Number 7, Mary Laveau. Mary Laveau is an absolute legend in practice and by lore. Her mysterious past and practices made her the absolute talk of the town. She was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Voodoo or voodoo is a combination of West African religions brought over to the Americas through the slave trade. It then blended with Christianity and the traditions of indigenous peoples. Marie was the first generation of her family to be born free, but due to laws and practices of the time, Marie and her husband bought and sold around 8 slaves in their lifetime. Though it was also believe that she aided in the escape of slaves as well. But what she is most famous for is her work as a voodoo queen in New Orleans. Many wealthy and politically connected individuals paid Laveau to aid in personal advice, intervention and protection from evil energy. She also worked as a hairdresser which gave her access to information regarding her clients because honestly, let's be honest, everyone's hairdresser is their therapist. Honestly, what didn't this woman do? She also ran an orphanage and helped many children have a safe home. Laveau is a popular figure in legend and lore due to her relationship to the occult, but her role in society was much larger and a little bit more scandalous than that. Number 6, Louisa Cassati. Also known as the Divine Marquise, we have yet another woman of mystery on this list. Louisa Cassati beguiled everyone she came across. She was a young, well born heiress who married into the Lombardy aristocracy. The mundane was an insult to her. She dressed in extravagance wherever she went, dyeing her hair fiery shades, darkening her eyes with makeup, and contouring with coal. Her her guiding principle in life was to imitate art, as opposed to art imitating life. But due to her extravagant presentation, she became the muse of dozens of famous artists. Thanks to her immense fortune, she traveled the world leaving a trail of lavish parties that even Gatsby would gawk at. Every party topped the last. She had a collection of very special drugs, naked servants gilded in gold, wild animals. Her tombstone reads, age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Number 5. Madame Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker broke records and blasted through glass ceilings as the first self-made female person of color millionaire in America. She made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair care products for black women. Her parents were slaves who worked in Louisiana, but she was the first of their children to be born free after the Emancipation Proclamation. After an experience with hair loss, she created the Walker system of hair care. She had a knack for self-promotion that started by selling directly to the clients and then employed beauty cultural to hand sell her wares. She not only continued to build her business, but she also kept a hand behind her to help lead future generations towards success. Walker used her fortune to help fund scholarships for women, donated large sums to NAACP and the Black YMCA, among other charities. An absolute legacy. Number 4, Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft is a feminist icon who began setting the groundwork for women's rights all the way back in the late 1700s. She authored A Vindication of Rights of Women in 1792, which is considered the earliest treaties advocating for women's rights. Wollstonecraft was born in the age of the Enlightenment in England. The Enlightenment is pretty much as it sounds, an intellectual period which advocated for reason to obtain objective truths. As part of this movement, Mary and her sister founded a girls school in London in 1780. 
1984 to educate young girls. She continued to write articles advocating for the education and equality of women in society throughout her life. She believed that if women weren't educated to the same degree as men were, then society would come to a standstill. Sadly, Mary never fully saw the success of her ideas. She died during the birth of her second daughter, Mary, who, funny enough, would go on to write one of the most controversial books in history, Frankenstein. Number three, Mae West. I see a man in your life. One, only one. Mae West. As sassy as she was on screen, she was even more so off of it. Her wisecracking, quippy sensuality became a sensation people couldn't get enough of. West started out in vaudeville and Broadway before she hit the big screen, singing and doing acrobatics. By 1926, Mae began to write and produce her own plays, the first being titled Sex. Her performance was of a woman of the night, and you can imagine the stir she caused. It also earned her an eight day jail sentence for corrupting the morals of youth. She loved to ridicule social attitudes towards sexuality which became a part of her trademark style. She was also a big supporter of the gay community, even writing a play called Drag as a celebration of drag in New York City, on top of it being a living room comedy. As you can guess, this also stirred up some serious controversy. But despite it all, Wes seemed to enjoy the reaction of the private and reserved public, loving every minute that it made her famous. Number two, Marsha P. Johnson. Marsha P. Johnson is most famously known for her work to help support the LGBTQ plus movement in New York City for nearly 25 years. Marsha played a key role in the Stonewall riots that found the gay pride movement today. She was a drag performer and black trans woman who did everything she could to advocate for trans youth, homeless people, and people living through the AIDS epidemic. She even used money she earned as a night worker to help fund a refugee for homeless people. Along with fellow activist Sylvia Rivera, she founded STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, which created a safe place for homeless trans youth to sleep and feel safe. It was the first LGBTQ shelter in North America. Sadly, however, John Johnson never got to see how far the movement would take the world as she died in 1992. Her body was found in the Hudson River and it was ruled that she took her own life. However, many suspect foul play as her case was never actually investigated, they just assumed. Many activists believe today that someone had indeed taken her life. Marsha P. Johnson danced, performed, and rioted her way to making the public listen to the voices people were afraid to hear, and her legacy lives on today. And last but not least, Rosa Parks. One of the loudest scandals in history that ferried in waves of change was the decision Rosa Parks made one day to stay seated on a bus. It was a scandal that transformed the world. In 1955, Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man from Montgomery, Alabama. This simple and brave refusal initiated the civil rights movement in the United States. Her actions inspired the Montgomery bus boycott, led by a young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Up until this point, bus segregation was enforced, and the black community was forced to sit in the back of the bus always. It was also customary for bus drivers to request that black citizens give up their seat to white citizens. So one day when Parks was riding home from work, she was exhausted, the bus driver asked part of the back of the bus to stand to make room for a white citizen. Parks was the only one who refused and she was arrested as a result. In her autobiography, Parks writes, and I quote, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically, no. the only tired I was was tired of giving in. Number 10, Dracula. The man, the myth, the legend, Vlad the Impaler. This dude was so down bad, he was the inspiration for Dracula. There's really only one reason why he was so evil, and honestly, it's in his name. Vlad the Impaler liked to impale people, oftentimes alive, as if this was the worst thing thought up by a human being ever, he would leave the pikes on display, creating a horror only the eyes of medieval Europe could see. There's gonna be a lot of bad dudes on this list, some really saucy villains, unsavory characters who will make your skin crawl, but only Vlad has been bad enough to get a monster inspired by him, essentially turning his actions into somewhat of a spooky mythology. Dude gives off some serious goth energy. There's a few portraits of him, but if you look at it, he's got this stare in his eyes, like, like he wants to impale me or something. Vlad be nimble, Vlad be quick, just wait till you see his sharpened sticks. Number nine, the guy everyone knows. Look, YouTube won't let me say his name, but do we really have to? I mean, it's Mustache Man. Infamous for his bad art and lame book, he was the fascist leader of Germany. The very same leader who forced the world into World War II. Remember that one? Yeah. He's the very same monster who organized the destruction of Jewish peoples in Europe, and if he had his way, probably the whole world. I wouldn't be surprised if you showed a picture of him to anyone on Earth, any country, rich or poor, 
and they will most likely know who that was. That's the kind of evil that will get you talked about in classes all over the world, and likely for a long time. Eventually, he got what was coming to him, and the world had peace and prosperity, and there was never ever another bad stinky war ever again. Why is he not number one, you might be asking? Well, that's just because his numbers don't compare to others, which is a very troubling statistic. I'll get to that later. Number eight, busy man. Most people on this list are not going to need any introduction. Kangas Khan is no exception to that. The Mongol warrior king saw his nomadic empire stretch thousands of miles, being one of history's largest empires. If you've been paying attention in history class, and you should have been, don't skip class or Big Ched will put you in the naughty corner. But yes, that's right, I just referred to myself in the third person. Speaking of third person, that's how many people Kangas unalive in his bloody conquests. Oh, did I say three? I actually meant a lot. Did I say a lot? I actually meant a disturbing amount. Some people like to point out that he was accepting of other people's cultures and beliefs. Yes, that is true, but that's after he burned down the village right before he got to yours, and you got forcibly assimilated into his numbers. As you can also imagine, a bloodthirsty barbarian like him did not treat women with much respect. It's Kangas Khan, man. That's, that's just how it do be. Number seven, so long, Bowser. Ivan the Terrible. Okay, sure, Vlad was called the Impaler, but you can kind of take that a different way, right? Not in that way. All innuendos aside, with a name like Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of hard to work around that. Even as a child, Ivan was showing traits of an evil dictator, or supervillain really, as it's said that he would throw animals off of tall roofs in the same way that Mario throws Bowser off of platforms. Becoming the first Tsar of Russia, and probably its worst, he's responsible for many horrors and crimes, but the most infamous being his responsibility for his own son's demise. After a heated argument regarding his unborn grandson, and in a binding fit of rage, Ivan claimed his son's life. Sure, dads get angry when sons don't help mow the lawns or help take out the trash, but that's going a little far. One minute you're having a fight with your dad, and the next minute you're being carried out by Ghani and Paul Bears. You know, the dancing guys, the memes, the casket, you know? Yeah, it's a joke. Number six, the mad doctor. I love doctors. Shout out to the people working in the medical field right now. I appreciate you. I couldn't even imagine the horror that is medical school, though. We all know my track record for reading, and hours upon hours of studying would just be bad for my health. I gotta squeeze more video game time in there. It's just how I work, man. However, one doctor I would not want to cross is Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. He is most likely the inspiration for a lot of horror movies. A serial unaliver said to have been performing surgeries on animals at a young age. Which, again, doing some freaky deaky stuff to animals as a kid is like the red flag of red flags. It's like the only red flag. If that wasn't enough, he used to steal cadavers from the university he was studying at and, and doing all kinds of not nice things to them, not naughty, bad. Having a clear obsession with medical practices and anatomy probably was helpful in disposing of his victims. And like something from Tales of the Crypt Keeper, that's exactly what he did. He constructed a large house, or building really, with trap doors, secret tunnels, and a lot of rooms. A basement where he could dispose of his victims. He would later then open this house of horrors up as a hotel where unknowing people would come to meet their doom. Yes, it's Tales of the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> come check in to the Hotel of Doom. Number five. Bad comrade. Stosif Jolin was the leader of the Soviet Union for probably too long. A man who worked his way up the political chain until general secretary meant leader, which if you look it up, it's kind of crazy. That itself is a crazy story. He's responsible for a great loss of life. It is estimated in the range of 40 million people. Ooh, yikes. Most spooky evil dudes usually go after an enemy to someone they consider to not be part of them. He did do this, but a lot of his own people sadly met their ends from the Red Menace too. Organized and deliberate purges of people and famines to starve people. It's safe to say he is and was and always will be one of the worst humans to ever walk the face of the earth. To put it in perspective, Jolin's son was a soldier in World War II, and after being captured by German forces, the Germans thought they had one on the boss. Heck, this was a get out of jail free card, right? Well, when a prisoner trade was proposed by the Germans, Jolin laughed at only how an evil communist could, and denied the trade. His son would later perish in a POW camp shortly after. What a monster. 
You think you trade with me? Ah, keep them, I don't want. Number four, fine white powder. Oh, to be in Miami in the mid 1980s. If I had one wish, it would be to spend a summer night in the neon soaked beaches of Miami under strict laws enforced by a president who didn't know what was going on right underneath his nose. If you were around back then, then you probably got to experience something like that. Or at least in my fever dreams. I hope so. But as much as I'd like to be Tony Montana with all that sugar on his desk, I know it's bad for my health. Speaking of bad for your health, Pablo Escobar. I know, that's where I went with that. Probably the most ruthless criminal ever to live on planet Earth. Pablo was a poor man born in a poor country, but ended up being one of, if not the richest man on planet Earth. His lucrative distribution of adult sugar in the 80s made him very wealthy. It also made him very dangerous, as he was willing to do whatever to get his way. Extortion, bribing, bombing, just about anything you can think of. Oh yeah, he was one bad dude. He had so much money that he had to bury it all all over Colombia. Every once in a while, some of his buried treasure pops up. And as much as I want a quick million in US cash, I'll just put it back where it came from. Oh, Dios mío, lo siento, Pablo. Number three, Al Capone. Another ruthless criminal, and honestly, Capone walked so gangsters like Pablo could run. Part of the ruthless Italian mafia that was the outfit, Capone worked his way through the ranks during 1920s Prohibition America, earning millions in his time where really just $100 could stretch a long way. Capone is noted for his violent behavior throughout his life and the many accidents accidents he caused directly or indirectly. Prohibition and the depression were hard times for a lot of folks in America. However, the media and the people of Chicago at first always wanted to see what the lavish gangster was up to as his criminal life became somewhat publicized. Most likely due to his wealth. The dude was rich. He eventually would get arrested and sent to Alcatraz, which was probably the worst prison in America or the best Call of Duty Zombies map depending on how you look at things. I look at things through a Call of Duty way, so eh. Number two, Gavrilo Princip. That might not be a name that you're familiar with, but it was the man who unalived Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which caused the collapse of Soviet Russia, and it's why you live in a post-war globalist world with markets developing rapidly in the cyber world. Except maybe the whole thing in Ukraine, watch out for that. Kinda crazy to think how all that could come from one wrong turn and a guy seizing an opportunity. But this also means he's kind of responsible, in a way, for all the bad stuff that happened in those times as well. So maybe don't seize the day? I'm not sure. Just, just don't be ruthless criminals, guys. Watch our videos instead. Although I could blame them for failing my math test in high school. Yeah, we'll go with that. Number one, Mao Zedong. I'd like to come out here and tell you all about the chairman of China, but that simply is just too hot for TV, and if it's too hot for TV, it's too hot for YouTube. Basically, he was the dictator of communist China and is responsible for many lives lost. It's estimated to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 million people. Whoa. <laughs> Dude was down bad, the definition of down bad, and although many were told to adore him, there's still a great many people who remember the terrible things he's done. From Beijing to Hong Kong, there's not a person around who doesn't know who he is. If being a no good rotten person was an Olympic sport, he would have gold medals coming out of his ears. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out, 
Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries, and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene, who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836, and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So. Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is, until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is corset poke off but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks that should be a musical not frozen get out of here at number eight no side bays a bad relationship can really mess you up anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de medici did back in the day her didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken she basically turned into the type of person that was like if i'm not happy no one else is going to be happy either Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number five, Chelonis. 
The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris I. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chalonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number four, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number three, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic, keep it up. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also caused some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products. But for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one, 
Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, Family Feud. After making countless lists about kings and queens and learning about the lengths they go to to gain power, it shouldn't come as a surprise to learn that Emperor Nero did some pretty messed up stuff to secure his position of power. Though he would later become an absolute menace to Roman society, he might have picked up this whole violent seizure of power idea from his very own mother, since she pulled a stunt just to get Nero's foot in the door, so to speak. You see, Nero was never supposed to become emperor, but when Emperor Claudius married his niece, Agrippina, Nero's mother, she convinced Claudius to adopt Nero as his very own son, which he did. Mysteriously, Claudius died shortly after all this went down, which meant that Nero was now in line to inherit the throne. Nero became emperor at 17, and in an effort to secure his place of power, he got the bright idea to eliminate anyone who might try and come for his seat of power. And so, he poisoned his stepbrother, and later had his mother eliminated as well, because he saw how she took out Claudius, and he didn't want to meet the same fate. I guess you could say that this was the beginning of the end for the people of Rome and for Nero himself. Number 9, a whole lot of money. This guy was like king, the sudden king of France, or I guess the OG because that came way later. But anyways, in the early morning of June 18th and 64 CE, a huge fire broke out and this blaze burned for 9 days, destroying 14 of Rome's districts and severely damaging 7 others. A large portion of Rome was leveled from the fire. Many citizens lost everything, but rumors started to break out that perhaps Nero was the one who started the fire in the first place. Why? Well, this rumor started after the emperor decided to build an opulent palace for himself that took up a hundred acres. Rather than use the Roman treasury to rebuild the city, he spent it on building his dream palace that he named Domus Aurea or the Golden House. This palace was so expensive to build that Nero was forced to devalue the Roman currency in order to stretch his money. This didn't really mean much to him, but for the rest of the people, this was devastating to the economy. So to explain their misfortune, that arose after the fire, they blamed the emperor, claiming that he was the one who started the blaze, therefore rumors. Historians are still uncertain if that's true or not, since at the time of the fire, Nero wasn't even in Rome, but he could have hired someone to carry out the plan. So who knows? Though we may never truly know, but honestly, I wouldn't put it past him. Before we continue talking about the things that made Emperor Nero a mess up dude, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and consider subscribing to the channel to stay a part of the hive, because we'll love that. Number eight, the shaving festival. This is like totally Sweeney Todd in my head, anyways. In many cultures, there are coming of age celebrations. There's the quinceanera, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, and plenty of others around the world. Back during the rule of Emperor Nero, he came up with his very own version of a coming of age type of celebration, and it was thrown in honor of his beard. Yes, Nero created an entire festival to honor his facial hair. This takes me right back to grade A when all the boys were like, do you see it? Do you see it? Or like putting mascara on their mustaches? True story. In 59 CE, when Nero was 22 years old, he finally started getting enough facial hair to warrant being shaved. To honor this big event in his life, he invented Juvenalia, or the Games of Youth. This large festival was commissioned all because this guy was going to shave. Now, I'm not someone who grows facial hair like that, so I don't know if shaving your face for the first time is actually a big deal or not. Is it, Chris? Is shaving your face for the first time a big deal? It can be. All right, there we go. But anyways, this Juvenilia Festival became a showcase for the performing arts. Every kind of theatrical performance was present at this festival, and Nero was known to have participated in some performances, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's jump to the next point. 
Number seven, public performances. Let's talk about Emperor Nero, the actor. Nero always had a love for the arts. Many historians believe that if he never became emperor, then he would have become a performer. And some even think his dead dream of becoming a performer is what may have fueled his tyranny in the first place. He wanted his Oscar moment so bad, more than Leonardo DiCaprio, more than anything. And when Agrippina passed away, he found his chance. Nero wanted his popularity to rise, so he began to put on performances of songs he'd written in public. <laughs> Cringe. His active pursuit of the arts did the exact opposite, however. Roman nobles absolutely despised professional actors and actresses, so to see their leader do such a thing was an embarrassment. He even arranged his diet and activities around his artistic endeavors. Despite some of the more gritty details of this cruel emperor, his passion for the arts by all accounts was genuine. It was just super, super desperate, dude. Like, calm down. Number six, personal hype men. Rejected, rejected. Yeah, you just got rejected. R E J E. I hope you enjoyed that Zoe 101 reference, and yes, it is somehow related to Emperor Nero. Did I think I would ever use Zoe 101 and Emperor Nero in the same sentence ever in my life? No. No, I didn't. Goes to show we can't plan life, it just happens. But Nero wanted to make sure that no matter where he went or what happened, that he would always feel like he'd accomplished something awesome. So he hired his own little cheerleading squad of personal clappers. Well, not quite, there's some details missing. When Nero visited Alexandria, he was very impressed with the fashion in which the Egyptians clapped. So he summoned men from Alexandria and made sure more than 5,000 men learned the Alexandrian styles of applause. Then he made them do so vigorously when he sang. You're my wonder wall. Clap for me. The men had noticeable thick hair and no rings on their hands so they wouldn't get, you know, beat up so they could keep clapping. Number five, Antichrist. Was Nero the Antichrist? Well, a lot of people like to think so. Put someone really evil on Earth and that question always seems to appear somewhere. After Nero took his own life in 68 AD, spoiler alert, many people believed that it was a cover up and that he was still alive. Some men even came forward claiming to be Nero himself. Some of these men even stepped forward and sang in public like he used to do. Each of these men were punished, but rumors of his demonic survival continued. Prophets foretold his return, though that may have been more of a metaphor than in a literal sense. Nero was one of the most monstrous people of the time, so it's not surprising to think he is evil. From biblical forces to his crucifixion of Christians, which we'll get to later, the personification of the Antichrist was said to arise in the form of an emperor, which made Nero really match up quite well with that whole thing, so who knows. Number four, messed up love. So of course, Nero had his fair share of mistresses, but according to rumor, there was none closer than mummy dearest. That's right, we got some Oedipus Rex action right now, but that was most likely a rumor perpetuated against a hated tyrant, but still. Who can be sure? He and his mother often rode together in a litter and emerged with suspicious stains on their clothes, alleging what they might have done inside the litter. He also took up a mistress who looked a lot like his mother, which added fuel to the fire. Freud would have had a field day. But whatever love was between them would expire in 59 when Nero plotted to have his mother killed. His string of marriages were just as horrendous. His first wife, Octavia, he drove to take her own life. The second, he kicked to death while she was carrying. The third was his former mistress, whose husband he forced to take his own life so she would be free to marry him. Then there was Pythagoras, who was Nero's fave ex slave. In 64 AD, they kind of married, and Nero dressed as the bride. Nero also married another man named Sporus, who he also took away his manhood, should I say, so that he could be more of a woman in 67 AD. He took after his uncle Caligula when it came to taking advantage of the wives of his senators, which brings us to number three, animal games. I know, you know where I'm going with this. If you know where this is going, trigger warning folks, this man was warped if you hadn't figured that out. As I was saying, he was a really big fan of putting his senators into uncomfortable positions, putting them through massive ridiculous orgies, but he also devised an utterly horrendous and bizarre sex game where he would dress up as an animal covered in animal pelts, come out of a cage and attack men and women tied to stakes. But then when he got his like, you know, fill, he would go to one of his husbands to finish the job. In a way, he kind of sounds like an OG furry if furries were violent, but at the same time, Nero took his fetish way farther than anyone was comfortable with. Consent is sexy, unless you're an emperor apparently who literally takes 
mistakes lives if he doesn't get his way. He also allegedly had booths set up along the river he traveled filled with mechanisms for pleasure and concubines role playing innkeepers for his pleasure. That could be a rumor but honestly I wouldn't put it past him. Number 2 Night Lights just when you think things have gotten as worse as they could get, it gets worse. But of course, this is Nero we are talking about, not Robert De Niro. He's a nice guy. They didn't have electricity back then, obviously, right? So at night they had to have a way of lighting up the night. Now, most logical people would be like, yeah, let's light a few torches, use some fire. But Nero had a darker idea that conveniently humiliated and tormented the people he hated the most, the Christians. When Rome burned, Nero went on to shift the blame to the Christians. Thousands of the followers were rounded up and punished in incredibly cruel ways. But most notably, he built pyres, covered them with tar, and used them as torches for an imperial festival. Amongst the burning bodies, he had naked dancers come out and frolic around the poor victims. Going back to the Antichrist thing we mentioned earlier, I think this really makes like for an open and shut case. And last one, time to go. Okay, let's do a quick recap here. Bestiality, matricide, unalived his first wife and his second along with his kid. He basically bankrupted Rome by building his golden palace, raised taxes to pay for it, uh, violated consent in so many brutal ways. Nero to zero. Am I right folks? The emperor's Rome began to crumble and his officials were not happy. He would soon be declared public enemy number one. Not long after a Roman governor renounced Nero and his legion was defeated in Germany, it was only a matter of time for the tyrant. The praetorian guard charged with guarding the emperor himself renounced him and he was officially declared an enemy of the people by the senate on June 8th in 64. Nero knew he was done for, so rather than face the masses and account for his crimes, Nero took his own life to beat them to it. His last words were apparently what an artist dies in me and he died with his current mistress at his side she ensured he at least had a very decent burial but that was that for the tyrannical ruler 